Hello, and welcome to the Northwood Podcast. I'm your host, Heath Jones. And it's been a while between episodes. I think it's been two weeks since our last one, and then it was another two weeks before that one. And I usually like to release one a week. However, life circumstances have kept my schedule busy and sporadic, so I haven't had the time to work on these. I got sick first, and then some things... uh, well, I won't get into those details. Um, busy. So I haven't recorded as much or worked on these as much as I'd like. In fact, I've preached a few messages from the pulpit that I didn't record in this podcast form first, which is my usual practice. So what I plan to do with those is send the raw audio from those public talks to our producer at the All Indiana Podcast Network. And history has shown me that they can make something even out of that. So expect that in the future. And I think it's kind of it creates a different dynamic, a live talk, as opposed to me just speaking this monologue right at this camera. Speaking, though, of the All Indiana Podcast Network, I'd like to let you know about them. If you have not heard that they publish podcasts made and recorded here in Indiana and often about topics related to our state, though not necessarily. If you're interested in checking those out, please visit www.wishtv.com backslash podcasts. That's wishtv.com backslash podcasts. And as for my church, Northwood Christian Church, where I pastor, I hope you can find us online or in person. We live stream on Sundays, but you can also join us. If you'd like to know more about that, our website is www.indyncc.org. That's indyncc.org. And There you'll be able to access all the information that you may need, such as service times and opportunities for you to get plugged in as well. And also you can read about our values. Lastly, if you are just now finding this podcast, uh, please subscribe, follow, or like it by way of whatever app you're using. This way you'll know when new episodes are released. And same for the YouTube folks. If you haven't, please subscribe to my channel, et cetera, et cetera. You You know the shtick. So now we're on to the meat of the episode, beginning with a reading from the Gospel of Mark chapter 7. But first, we need to pause for some ads for our podcast audience. And so if that means you, I'll catch you just after. And we're back. And as I was saying before, we'll be considering a passage from Mark 7, specifically Mark 7 verses 24 through 30. And I'll just read them now. That's Mark 7, 24 through 30, in case you want to read it later or, you know, follow follow along as you, as I read it here. But it goes. From there he, he being Jesus, set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit, immediately heard about him. And she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrio-Phoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. And when she went home, she found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. That's the end. And the story is paired with one that will come next. One in which... um, One that does go with this, but we're not going to consider it today for time constraints. And we'll just keep it clean, streamlined, and to the point. But I'll just mention that the story that comes next um, as a springboard for what's going on here. In the next story, Jesus restores the hearing of a deaf man. And not just any deaf man. This man, like the woman in our story today, was a Gentile, a Greek-speaking outsider, However, Jesus restored the hearing of this deaf Gentile. The point here is that Jesus came not just to open up the ears of understanding of his own people, the Jewish people, but also of the Gentiles. That's that's us, of all people, in fact. And this was astonishing in his time, not just for Jesus' community, 
Um, but for really any community, for most, I think we're insular and inward focused. But in Jesus's community, it was believed that Gentiles must be kept outside at all costs. You may recall how last week we considered a story in which Jesus's disciples were chided for failing to keep purity rituals. Namely, they didn't wash their hands. And the text makes mention of how his community also had rituals that called them to clean pots, pans, plates, and kettles, you know, any th- other form of eating, accrout- accoutrement, um, or what you use to eat. And this was so that the ritually pure eater or drinker may be sure that no impure lips had touched these utensils before, or any other unclean creature or item. It could be different things. So that being the case, let's go back and consider the woman from our story that we just read. Her story begins with a glaring red flag to warn the reader. Jesus was entering into the region of Tyre. You may not have, may have skipped your notice, my notice at first, but the original readers wouldn't know of the significance. And of this region, Dr. Ron Allen and Clark Williamson write, not only was Tyre a Gentile area, but according to Isaiah 23, 1 through 16, and Ezekiel 26, 28 uh, through 29, God condemned Tyre because its population followed idols, defiled holy places, and practiced injustice and violence in trade with Israel. At the time of Mark, Tyre was still regarded as an area of exploitation and hostility. And here they cite Josephus, which you can read more about the way that this region was viewed in that time. It goes on, continuing the quote, a sign of which, the violence, was that many crops grown in Galilee were sold in prosperous Gentile tire while Galilean peasants hungered. It's from their book, Preaching the Gospel Without Blaming the Jews. In summary, this woman is in Tyre. That's strike one, this region known for violence and hostility to Jesus's community. Strike two, She's a Gentile herself. She is no Hebrew who finds herself living in a primarily Gentile area. She is a Gentile, and the text makes no bones about it. Mark wants the reader to know that. Quoting here from verse 26, Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrio-Phoenician origin. Just lays it out there. And being a Gentile, she was a Greek-speaking outsider. The author's highlighting of her Syrio-Phoenician origin in, in this text just serves to greater highlight the rifts between her community and Jesus. It's just twisting the screw looser here. And it gets worse, if you can imagine. She has approached Jesus, this woman, Gentile, Syrio-Phoenician woman, approached Jesus unaccompanied by a male relative, breaking yet another cultural taboo. So what is Jesus to do? Well, you'd expect him to ignore her or maybe do Well, what comes next, unfortunately? But first, before we get to that story, I was once sitting at a table with a diverse group of clergy. In fact, I was not in the majority in this setting. And as we sat, a pastor said a racial slur, loud and unabashed for everyone to hear. It was directed at another passerby, but there were several at my table for whom the slur also had especially painful connotations. So I sat uncomfortable as to what I should do. Perhaps I should address the man who had shouted the slur. Uh, No matter, they passed and they were gone before I could really do much, I think. Our motives are always unclear, but either way, I turned to the man sitting next to me and I muttered, I'm sorry, or something like that. And he said, you know, at least we know where that man stands. Also, he wanted to explain that he had heard that word before many times. It merely reflected the schisms between different people groups that already exist before we heard we're privy to that conversation. So now back to our story and to our question, what is Jesus to do? And what he does is hardly better than what I just described. It's very troubling. After she begs for an exorcism for her daughter, and we won't get into exorcisms and demons and think healing here, made whole is the point. Uh, And Jesus answers her plea for healing in the following way. Verse 27, he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take children's food and throw it to the dogs. There are several things to notice here. If you're scratching your head, it really is quite plain what's going on. 
If Jesus' words come across as harsh, rude, even mean, it's for a reason they are. By let the children be fed first, he means the children of Israel. In other words, Jesus is voicing an age-old, all-too-common prejudice. He's saying, I'll take care of me and my own people first. I came for my own kin. So Jesus is saying that it wouldn't be right to share his blessings, his healing powers with the likes of her. It's what he's saying. And here we arrive at the last and most brutal detail. Jesus finishes the line with these words. It is not fair to take the children's food, you know, signifying a parental relationship, a loving, nurturing relationship. It's not fair to take that and throw it to the dogs. And that last word here translated as dogs has a history. It is an outright and overt slur with racial connotations. It is used several times before in the Hebrew Bible to refer to those who are not welcome or are otherwise deplorable. And here I have cited several examples, Deuteronomy 23, verse 19, 1 Samuel 17, verse 43, and chapter 24, verse 14. I'm not going to read all of them, even from some of the apocryphal books. It's all there again and again. The last important thing I want to notice about Jesus' harsh words, though, aside from it's well-documented that this is a word meant to hurt. But there's also this mention of a meal is the last thing we are to notice. Jesus told the woman that he came to feed his people. Feed his people. This language calls to mind other things Jesus said about meals, namely the meal in the realm of God, the table to which everyone is invited, where our communion tables point us towards. Jesus is here saying, I came to invite not everyone, but my own kind to this meal, not the dogs, not those who my culture has decided are not, well, clean. And it's Jesus saying this, so what to make of it? Well, there are two options I'd like to consider here. If you're holding your breath or confused, one, it's possible that Jesus, being human as well as divine, is embodying the common prejudices of his day, the ones he was raised in, There are other moments where Jesus shows weakness or the signs of human frailty, loses his temper and the like. Perhaps we have here such a moment. However, those whose theology prevents Jesus from making such mistakes will likely be troubled by this interpretation. So for you, there are other options. The second option I'd like to consider wonders if it is possible that Jesus is merely putting on putting on like a mask the prejudices of his day in this story on purpose to make a larger point. In this view, Jesus does not embody these prejudices per se, but is rather voicing them aloud for you and I to shock us, to wake us up to the prejudices around us. Perhaps Jesus is only voicing these prejudices that he knew were alive in his room, perhaps even in the hearts of his disciples, and in naming them, new possibilities open up. Which is what happens next, in fact. The woman bravely pushes back and claims her space, or at least a little space. Remember, she's a solitary woman, addressing Jesus alone, breaking a social taboo, and even doing that. She was not supposed to speak to Jesus directly, but she did. She said, even the dogs deserve the crumbs from the table. I'll make a few points here. One, even crumbs from God's table are more than we need. There are Ample uh, parables and stories to tell us that these crumbs are no mere pittance. Like a seed in God's kingdom springs to life and grows, and a small amount of yeast worked into a lump of dough can bring about a great result. Small faith, move mountains, that sort of thing. So crumbs, yes, enough. And second, even if the woman were to own this labeled dog, as she seems to do here in this story, these two are fed in God's kingdom. Work with me here. Even if the prejudices of her age had been correct, and they weren't, but had they been, even if God, even if to God she were nothing but a low-down Greek, Gentile, Syrophoenician, a woman, a dog, if all those labels God owned as well of her in relation to her, even if these labels deserve the negative connotations that they carried in her day, still, still, she would be fed from God's table. So think of it for a second. Even if the slaveholders of our country's earliest centuries had been correct about their bunk, unscientific, and immoral racist beliefs, which they weren't correct, but as a hypothetical work with me here, even if 
the image racists hold of other races were correct. Still, says the woman in our story, even they deserve to be fed from God's table, which that really puts, uh, puts a problem before the racists. How will they ever love with so much hate? In other words, even if the racists were right by way of their junk science and bigotry, they shouldn't act like racists in the final analysis. However, they're wrong. And I've been proven so in numerous ways, and we don't have time to get into that here, the junk racist science and the histories that go with it. Back to the woman in our story. She made the case for crumbs for herself and her daughter. Even dogs deserve crumbs. But as we read other stories about Jesus, we'll discover that he came to invite the likes of this woman up to the table to sit alongside the rich and the powerful. In fact, Jesus told a parable that suggests that in the realm of God, women like the women in our story will be given the seats that were kept before for kings and rulers. Jesus says, when you set a party, set a table for a party, put the least and the last in the places of honor. Well, here the woman's daughter, because of her faith, was made well. The woman certainly was blessed by her encounter with Jesus, but I really think that Jesus was primarily interested in teaching the others in the room, those who held the prejudices he voiced, those who in other company used those very slurs. They heard Jesus give voice to their own community's ugly feelings about people like this woman. Then they witnessed this woman stand up for herself to discover that Jesus welcomed her too in the end. Should she stick around? She'll discover herself to have more than crumbs in God's realm. She'll have everything good along with everyone else, you and I. But we must open up our hearts to all to enjoy ourselves in those places. And as the disciples move forwards with Jesus along the way, they'll meet others like her. Only next time, maybe they won't have to navigate prejudice and ugly words before welcoming an outsider in. Maybe they'll have had those just conversations with themselves and others, and in time they'll stop caring about the differences between theirs and other people groups as they are reminded that we are all God's children. Same is true still. The prejudices of our day divide us. We are divided by cultural, ethnic, religious, and political differences. Perhaps we keep some of those who sit in other ideological or cultural camps at a figurative arm's length. Well, against your will or with it, these two are invited to God's table, shoulder to shoulder, elbow to elbow with us. We've our own list of slurs and words that we use to distinguish ourselves from those that we don't like. But today, we are invited to sit along with the woman, even the blank, fill in the blank, are worthy from crumbs from God's, of the crumbs from God's table. Even the blank are worthy. And it's for you to fill in the blank with the person or people group you struggle to include in your own conception of God's realm. Even the Palestinians, even the citizens of the state of Israel, even the Ukrainians, even the Russians, even the Republicans, even the Democrats, even the Libertarians, all. We could go on. You've likely your own list, and I hope it's short. But realize all of these are not only worthy of crumbs, but of everything that comes with membership into God's family. What we need most these days is a long overdue family reunion with this human race. We cannot control the situation at large, but we can impact our own communities. We can make every attempt to be ever widening our circles, our spheres of influence and love. And when we find prejudices in our own hearts, we can repent where we stand or in time weed out what poisons us. In these times, perhaps now more than ever, it is important to remind our American hearts that there is no distinctly American Jesus. I feel that 
in this age of division in the United States, it is important for Christians to remember that Jesus came to give us all more than crumbs and that Jesus came to love and restore all of those on planet Earth. Jesus came for us all, our enemies, ourselves, and all must mean all. Even the dogs deserve more. Thanks be to God. And the dogs are precious in God's eyes.